is a good title as well. So, anyway, um, the uh, title of my presentation is around uh, crop R&D uh, improvement. It is really revolving around rice and corn. As you can see, I'm highly involved in these two crops and the challenges and opportunities in the emerging markets in Asia Pacific. So I'll just give you a quick overview of the uh, Asia Pacific corn and rice production, uh, and then go through the some the production challenges and opportunities for R&D in the region. And then I will introduce a little bit about our company, uh, Syngenta, and uh, what we are doing actually to address the, the challenges and how we uh, help farmers uh, be more efficient in their production systems. And then I uh, talk about how we integrate different technologies to increase the uh, yield of uh, the corn and rice farmers. As uh, we are talking uh, uh, today, there are about 1,870 million people going hungry tonight. So that's a large number of people to, to feed, actually. And by 2015, there will be additional 2 million people to feed. So that's a lot of people to really keep this uh, nutritional food uh, three times a day. And the demand for food actually is uh, driven uh, by population growth, as all of you probably know already, uh, with the uh, rising calorie consumption. So as countries in, uh, in Asia, including Philippines, as the uh, uh, grow economically, they also want to eat more meat. So that's also driving the consumption for corn, because corn basically is uh, uh, for animal feeds, uh, around 70% that. So th this is really very challenging because uh, if you can see here in the slide, the uh, populations in the developed countries actually did not change, actually, but it's where the emerging markets in Asia that's really um, making a lot of you know, uh, demand on not only food, but other resources. And the 50% increase of the demand is really largely driven by these uh, emerging countries. So if you look at uh, Asia Pacific now, um, this is the tropical belt that uh, basically produced most of the rice in the region, where India has around 45 million hectares. And I will show you some videos later on. And corn, of course, is around 20 million hectares in this tropical belt. And the temperate areas in Asia that includes China forest is the, the big elephant in the room there. We have around 35 million hectares of corn and another 30 million hectares of rice. So we, we would say that Asia Pacific is really the, uh, the center of corn and rice production. Because if you add corn and rice for Asia Pacific, you know, that, that accounts for more than 50% of the total area of production. So for, for corn, you're almost one third uh, Asia Pacific accounts almost one third of the total area. And then for rice, it's 90%. So in the total area for rice is 160 million hectares, which is really uh, mostly in India and China. Um, so the, the breakthrough question is really how we can feed 9 billion people by 2050. With the backdrop of increasing population pressure, uh, decreasing cultivated land area, as there's a lot of pressure to, for people to urbanize, then there's this problem of decreasing soil fertility. It is really not very much appreciated by our policy makers. Because they are not seen, right? It's underground, but it's actually one of the biggest uh, uh, challenges in our production systems now in, in Asia and throughout the world, of course. Then we know about global warming, that's for sure, uh, impacting the way how we grow crops. Water is now less available. So the global warming, a lot of people, you know, drilling uh, holes to get water to irrigate their uh, crops. I was in India last week, and in Hyderabad, where we have a breeding station for rice and corn, we really have difficulty now getting water because of the organization. People try to stick tubes there, and you know, we grow water every day 
so you end up with water table going down. So countries like India will be reaching a critical um, problem uh, for water, not only for irrigation but drinking water as well. <clears throat> then we have increasing pressure from pests and diseases as uh, the world is uh, warming uh, this very conducive for the uh, growth and reproduction of common pests and diseases for uh, the crops. And then there's a competing need for food and fuel. Uh, you probably heard about uh, ethanol. Uh, it's a big issue in the U.S., not in the U.S., in Brazil and other countries, the competing needs for feeding people and using corn, for example, to generate uh, biofuel or ethanol. So this is a big issue, actually, uh, globally. So if, if you look at the consumption, uh, growth will come from emerging Asia. Uh, this is in the case of corn, where you know Vietnam, even Indonesia, and some countries in the Philippines uh, requiring a lot of corn. These countries are experiencing a lot of economic growth. So people they have more income, they have more power to go to McDonald's or Jollibee to eat chicken. And if you eat chicken or pork or other animal products, 70% of that actually is corn. Because corn uh, using a, used, being used as feed, 70% of the production globally on the average. <coughs> then we have, of course, uh, for corn, we have <coughs> this uh, low production. Like in the Philippines, our average is around 2.5 versus 9.5 metric tons in the US, or 7.5 metric tons in Argentina. So most of the emerging countries, uh, maybe except for China, we have this big gap from the potential yield with the actual yield. So we actually have uh, better opportunities here in, in the region to really uh, increase the, the yield per unit area because the land is not increasing anymore. And the only way to feed nine buildings to increase your production per unit area. There's no other way around. Land will always go down as more people occupy it and as more factories and urbanization creeping in, then you really have a lot of pressure to increase the yield per unit area. Um, I'm sorry. In the case of rice, um, there is a big challenge there because the average uh, yield increase must rise from 50 kilograms per hectare to 71 kilograms per hectare by 2030. That's around 50%, as indicated earlier. You have to, that's 2030 is, most of us are still alive at the time. <laughs> we retired by the time, but most of the young generation, you will have families, you will have kids. And um, we need to increase production by 50%. That's a tall order, considering that uh, rise right now um, of uh, really the productivity actually through the years has not uh, increased much. And so if, if you have the theoretical potential for rice, for example, 50%, let's say 10 metric tons, if you don't provide any inputs, you will only get two metric tons, okay? So how do you go to the potential of 10 metric tons from two metric tons? So you, you have to use new varieties, new hybrids, new rural varieties that will probably contribute around 20%. You have to do irrigation in the right uh, fertilization regime to improve another 30%. And then around 50% is really from cultivation uh, using crop protection products and other inputs to minimize the stress, like drought, uh, uh, soil stress, uh, etc. So there's a lot of things that uh, we in the com uh, scientific community can do to help drive the theoretical potential yield. And if you, in the Philippines, of course, uh, you have been to the countryside, uh, most of our planting operations are still manual. We're still using the big buffaloes there. Uh, although there are trends nowadays to use um, uh, planters, but still we are way, way behind compared to developed countries. And if this is causing the uh, problem as well because uh, um, mechanization is really one of the ways to make it more efficient. But unfortunately, 
um, most of our farms are less than one hectare, it's very difficult for a farmer operator to buy a tractor. So the only way is to put a group together as a cooperative to invest in machinery. And I was in Chile last day, I took this picture because this is a GPS control. So I was really, I felt uh, jealous <laughs> that these farmers there are using a GPS control tractor. Uh, um, and the, the planter there is actually a variable planter. So one of the latest technology, planting technology is that when a planter goes through the rows, it will analyze soil okay, as it goes. And then it's connected globally to a database and say this portion of the soil needs 30 kilograms of nitrogen more than the other plant. So that's why it's called variable planter because it will deliver nitrogen differently in different spots depending on how the, the, uh, the, the tester uh, analyzed the soil. So this is the latest that it, you know, in, in, in the current technology in most of the world, you know, they just have straight uh, the same volume of fertilizer as they go through the rows, but nowadays, because of the uh, you know, um, <coughs> advances in uh, biological or computer, computational biology, it will allow now to have machines that will deliver that exact amount of input, row by row or spot by spot. So that becomes very efficient. In countries like uh, China, uh, we are also experiencing some of these uh, problems like the corn after rice or corn after wheat. Uh, I say problem, it's not really a problem per se because it will allow the farmers to increase the production per unit area. It's a kind of relay planting. But the problem is if you have that kind of continuous planting, you will, it will uh, 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 drive the uh, occurrence of more pest and diseases. The incidence of pest and disease will become more severe as the plant from one generation to the next generation. So it's always a, a challenge in, in, in Asia. Because again, if you go to the US, they only plant once a year. You have a winter, right? It's all over and there to kill most of the uh, pests. But in, in tropical Asia, farmers are planting continuously. So it will you know, influence the dynamics of pests and diseases. That's probably know in your biology class already. And you have all these kind of uh, diseases that's really causing a lot of problems. So you really have to address uh, problems holistically. Uh, you know, cropping system, mechanization, you know, how you control pests and diseases. Because most of this uh, diseases like northern common decline or downhill field, particularly is devastating. In Indonesia, for example, in this Java, downhill field, reduce yield by as much as 80% mm -hmm. if you don't control it with a chemical control. So from the genetics perspective, we are trying to develop new hybrids or varieties that can tolerate uh, uh, this kind of diseases. But it's still a big problem. Uh, harvesting is pretty much uh, manual. There's a lot of uh, different requirements for grain quality. This is China. Uh, in China, this is how we store the, the corn uh, ears, you kind of pan it and dry it, then you wait for a better price for the seller. So, but again, uh, in general, in Asia, farmers are experiencing 20 to 30 percent drop in yield or losses uh, uh, due to post harvest problems. Okay, so we're going to this water stress because uh, this is a big issue, um, global warming, and uh, it's, it's causing a lot of stress also <laughs> for the scientists who are working on uh, drought tolerance uh, work. And before I go into that, um, you know, maybe most of you drank a cup of coffee today, right? How many of you have drank a cup of coffee today? Good number. So the reason I presented this is because when you drink a cup of coffee, you realize that that cup of coffee requires 140 liters to produce the beans. Okay? Another 20 liters to produce the teaspoon sugar. And another 200 
liters in for milk that goes in. Total, 360 liters for one cup of coffee. So every time you drink coffee, remember that, you know, 360 liters was used up or were used up to have that very nice, nice smelling coffee. Just remember, I'm not saying that you stop drinking coffee. <laughs> Uh, it's just reality. <clears throat> so if we look at uh, individual crops, uh, sorghum, of course, we know this is a uh, tolerant drought. It's, in, in terms of field crops, it is a crop that uh, needs the least amount of water. Our favorite crop, which is rice, needs 5,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of grain. Okay? You can imagine the amount of water that rice needs just to feed 9 billion people, right? They can feed people. And it will really put a lot of pressure on our production system. In 2007, there was a big drought um, in, in Asia um, with a total uh, a cost of around 30 billion uh, uh, lost uh, revenues or lost crops. In Australia, it's uh, Around more than around 10 billion dollars, and that was mostly uh, the impact on wheat. It's around 60 percent. Most of the other crops were were also impacted by the long drought. So you, you can see the impact of water stress to the economy. It's the 30 billion dollars impact, just one year of drought. And as we experience more years of drought, then it will continue to uh, uh, import um, this loss losses. So at Syngenta, I'll just uh, tell you very quickly what we are doing uh, as a company. Um, we are doing uh, R&D, of course, and uh, commercialization of uh, crop protection chemistry. Uh, we are into uh, precision, oh, sorry. we are into uh, precision breeding and plant genomics. It's part of the three-leg approach for uh, helping the farmers. And then, of course, uh, we do a lot of innovation in biotechnology. And we, of course, um, uh, use unique combination of technology platforms, like genomics, uh, bioinformatics, uh, combinatorial chemistry, etc., to come up with some solutions for the growers. And in the case of biotechnology, we, uh, we do a lot of uh, R&D from input traits to output traits, so input traits, um, you know, those uh, insect uh, resistance traits, like wheat and corn, or runoff ready uh, crops, and then to output traits like high oil uh, soybean, or high quality oil soybean, and uh, other you know, nutritional crops that helps the consumer. So we are addressing both sides of the equation, is making farmers more efficient at the same time. Uh, find new sources of value for the consumer. It's just uh, when I did the, the first uh, BD corn listing for the company and just show really how clean the, the technology versus the uh, uh, non bd for example, almost double the year. The, the biggest benefit of this technology is that you actually end up with very clean corn because when the corn borer goes through the ears, it, it actually uh, brings all this kind of diseases like uh, mycotoxin, right? The, the fungal uh, diseases that uh, causes a lot of this mycotoxin problem, like the Claudia era, the Sion era. So if your ears or plants are protected, then you don't have that avenue for the ear rats to come in. So that's, that's kind of indirect uh, impact of uh, BD corn, for example. And right now in the Philippines, almost 100% of commercial corn, hybrid corn farmers are using this technology together with the herbicide uh, tolerance rates. We also come up with um, a brand called uh, AgroSure uh, Artesian. This is the, fir the industry's uh, first water optimized technology for corn hybrids. And it delivers improved yields from dry land and limited irrigated acres. And research demonstrates up to 15% yield preservation under moderate to severe moisture stress. So if you look at that 50%, that's a lot of corn 
been preserved uh, under drought condition. So we actually tested the concept, the proper concept of this technology in the US. And the, this is the actual uh, recovery. We actually recovered 22%. So under full water, I mean, fully irrigated environment, the uh, technology actually uh, outperformed slightly the conventional products. Under drought condition, the technology delivers a 22% yield recovery. So that's a lot of corn. So that's the, uh, and then, but to do that, uh, you really have to invest in R&D. And uh, you have to have this uh, computerized system of controlling uh, water regime in your field. So we have to control the water delivery so you can actually screen materials. Because if you can just plant it in the open field, hoping water not come in, uh, you know, you'll never get the results that you wanted. So you really have to control uh, water delivery artificially. And of course, uh, the, the science behind agri-sure partition technology, and some of you probably have major here in genetics and plant breeding, so you probably understand about, you know, um, you are screening, we are screening thousands of uh, genes. These are not genes, these are negative traits. These are natural genes that are already in natural corn diversity. We screen them uh, in that artificial environment and characterize those candidates and come up with a combination of genes. And right now we have around 13 genes. The artificial technologies are 13 genes that we put together uh, in, in commercial products that deliver that 22 percent uh, yield preservation. So th this kind of uh, requires a lot of science to have. But for the farmers, they don't really care. They, they, they want something that can help them uh, control losses due to drought. That's, that's the problem. Right? So uh, we're coming to this uh, concept called integrated crop solution. Because there is not one solution that can address all these problems. It has to be integrated. And so the, the integration of genetic and non-genetic solutions like best agronomic practices, precision breeding and biotechnology, and combinatorial chemistry should go hand in hand to deliver the benefit to the farmers. And um, integrating these different technology platforms is the best way really to uh, raise productivity by enhancing the synergy of the individual technology. So it's kind of one plus one plus one plus five basically, not three, okay? Because there's a synergy when you put together a combination of technologies, you have that kind of enhancing effect that actually uh, adds up and, you know, the, the, the total is more than the, the sum of the different uh, systems. Um, so I'm giving here some example of craft solutions that can be integrated by a seed, for example, um, we have superior to plus and, you know, high yielding varieties, best uh, resistant varieties through innovation from precision breeding. And then we have the biotic traits uh, that includes uh, biotic and aerobic stresses, you know, disease, the drought, etc. Uh, through the innovation of biotechnology and native traits. And we have, of course, uh, seed care crop protection that uh, early in the season you know, control of broad spectrum pest control of the enhanced plant. Uh, paper and it has some kind of multiple uh, modes of action. So if you combine them together, uh, this, this will become a unique combination of crop solutions uh, or value offers that can be tailored to address the specific needs of the farmers to promote a cost-effective and sustainable farming system. And uh, recently we have this um, uh, integrated soil called grow more in rice. This is helping small holders farmers to grow more rice and improve grain quality. So what this grow more is really around you you uh, apply different technologies at different phases of crop uh, cycle from seeding stage to pre flowering or building stage to product flowering stage to grain feeding stage up to harvesting. So you, you look at rice production holistically from planting to harvesting and try to integrate a combination of solutions that can enhance the value of those offers. 
And so uh, what we are saying here is the first 60 days of maximizing the uh, potential. Because if you have a lot of weeds or a lot of disease and the seedlings are 20 days old, you basically lose all your, all your yield or at least 50% of your yield already if you turn to some intervention. So you have to take care of the first 60 days and then take care of the last 60 days delivering the potential. So you, you really have to look at that uh, at a more holistic level. Uh, okay, so uh, I think this I'm just kind of summarizing uh, the population growth uh, pressure and the impact of the uh, different stresses uh, really uh, needs the application of new tools and technologies to improve crop yield and quality levels. There are a lot of opportunities to apply a broad range of crop solutions um, to help drive the next level of farm productivity. So technologies are available now. It's just really a matter of putting them together into the value offer for the farmers. Uh, by integrating some of the solutions, we can increase the production uh, efficiency of safe, healthy, and more affordable food feed that uh, we need and we want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lodolonio, for that very that high informative uh, presentation, presenting to us some of the solutions to improve uh, the productivity or the yield of rice and corn the same gentle way. Okay, any the floor is now open for your questions, insights, and comments. Questions? Yeah, Dr. Lodolonio is now ready to answer your questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions or comments, whatever. Just shoot it. <laughs> we have a few minutes. Okay. Is it very clear or not clear at all? <laughs> yes, I yes. Um, You mentioned earlier about something about precision breeding. So, is this the same as precision agriculture? Uh, it's, it's slightly different because when you say uh, precision breeding, you use genetic tools like marker assisted uh, breeding or genomics to develop new varieties or crops that can tolerate stresses, for example, or increase yield. The, the precision agriculture in general is around machineries, around you know how you can be more efficient your uh, delivery of uh, seeds or fertilizer in the field. And like the variable planter, like you know, you have the GPS uh, uh, enhanced system of uh, planting, harvesting, or delivering uh, crop protection products. Um, Follow-up question, does Injeta have plans to go into precision agriculture? Because I know that Monsanto is planning to go or to follow that path. Yeah, we actually call this uh, adjacent technologies, and uh, we are working with uh, partners actually to uh, provide this kind of uh, precision techniques. Like in China, we we are partnering with uh, local companies that enable uh, or increase the corn production by using planters or harvesters or even mulching technology, so we can improve their yield. So we don't really have to. Uh, invest directly, but we can partner with uh, other uh, companies or research institutions. You mentioned that uh, when, that to produce one kilogram of rice grain, dry weight, you need 5,000 liters of water. So is there a possibility that Syngenta can come up with a wheat of rice that will need less than 5,000 liters of water? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, most of the companies uh, involved in uh, breeding or genetic improvement um, are investing on uh, developing drought tolerant products, and we are one of them, of course, uh, in most of the crops, in corn particularly. In rice, we, we just kind of started this work, and I, I know you is doing some work on that. And, um, Certainly, this is a very challenging uh, aspect in rice production because in, in rice, you really need a lot of water 
that the body arrives. It is upland water, it's, it's not you know, any transplanted grass needs water. So it's a big challenge for us. Corn for me is relatively easy uh, to develop drought tolerance compared to rice. But uh, I, I think there, there should be some breakthrough as we try to understand the, uh, the genetic systems around uh, water efficiency. It's not around, it's more how you optimize the use of water. That's why we call it water optimization. So instead of, as you said, using 5,000, maybe you just use uh, 4,000 or 3,000. And yet, you still get the same amount of yield. So that's why we call that uh, water optimization. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Manny. I'm from Nianco Forestry. Uh, for for the last few years, my interest has been on precision forestry, and I was struck by the GPS control with the variable planter. What we're trying to do now is to put tags on every every plant and put them into a database so that we can monitor them. But really, my question is on uh, rising temperatures uh, brought about by climate change. Have you seen any uh, changes in the uh, more developed countries uh, due to uh, the rising temperatures? Is it uh, a, uh, a boom, in effect a, an opportunity for, for expansion of uh, planting areas? And on the other hand, in uh, the Asia Pacific or, or the less productive countries, uh, are you also seeing a different trend wherein there's a, on a geographic, geographic scale, uh, it's moving perhaps in terms of the productivity? Okay, thanks, yes. Good question. Um, in the U.S., for example, um, drought is, uh, there are years that drought will really impact a lot on production corn and soybean in the Midwest. And I think if you look at the last 20 years, there's more drought probably that have occurred per year or per five years compared to the last 100 years. So there's no question that this water stress is becoming very important. And But we, we look at this as an opportunity also to uh, invest in R&D that can help uh, farmers minimize the the lost uh, grains or revenues due to drought. And one of the technologies I showed was the artesian technology, wherein we partner with the, um, uh, the, the local operators of machineries. And then if you go to western Nebraska, where we, we have these pivots, you know, this round uh, irrigation system that can irrigate 100 hectares at one time. We work with them in terms of delivering the genetics, the um, artesian technology and then the crop protection or crop enhancement technology that goes with it through the irrigation system. So we deliver some of the crop protection products as the irrigator um, at their field. And farmers are actually seeing very dramatic results. So I, I, what I'm saying is that there, there's some opportunity around, uh, again, it's a combination of technologies. In, in, in Asia Pacific, it's not yet that sophisticated uh, level yet. Um, many companies are uh, doing a lot of research on drought tolerance, but the, the, the issue in, in Asia is that our production environment is so vital, it's very difficult to control the environment. So for example, in Thailand, we screen our materials during the summertime. And normally we plant in December, so hoping there's, there's no rain. Uh, around flowering time, because that's really the, the, the most critical stage, the flowering time, you can measure the, the response of different varieties or hybrids. Unfortunately, it rained last week and, you know, the experiment was uh, uh, damaged. And, uh, yeah, unlike in, in the U.S., you know, you, you have a very clear phenotyping or screening facility that there are no rains. We call that the managed stress environment that I showed. So, there, are, there is absolutely no rain during the rain period. You control the water delivery. 
using very sophisticated uh, watering system, uh, computerized. We, we control the water delivery by by people using laptops, uh, you know, while eating their dinner at home. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very sophisticated uh, technology and the environment is still controlled. So there's a lot of progress around that. So in, in Asia, we're still trying to to find areas, especially in the tropics, where the environment is not so easy to control. But I think there are some progress already that must be made. 